Hey, it's Jay. I wanted to extend a special thanks to those of you who have listened and left reviews on iTunes for this podcast. Please leave a review if you haven't done so already. We sincerely appreciate it. We're producing this show independently, and unfortunately, that is not free. We have to pay for digital hosting space, software, equipment, websites, and travel out of our own pockets. But we'd love to keep this show going as long as possible. Pledge your support by visiting www.bigbuckregistry.com forward slash pledge. Thanks for your support, and enjoy the show. Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast, powered by Advanced Takedown Tree Stands, episode number 189. Laura Zira, survivalist, persistence hunter, naked and afraid. Please support our sponsors as they make this show possible. Today's show is sponsored by Advanced Takedown Tree Stands and Morse's Sporting Goods. Big Buck Registry is a virtual museum of hunting stories. We preserve a piece of Americana by interviewing and recording hunters about their hunts and experiences from across the country. And who knows, maybe we'll learn a thing or two along the way that'll help us take our hunt to the next level. Hi, this is Barry Wenzel from Brothers of the Bow and Trophy Whitetail Boot Camps. I'm not really sure what a podcast is, but you're about to push play on what is now my favorite podcast, Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. No, Chuck Testa. No, Chuck Testa. And you're still listening to the Big Buck Registry Deer Hunting Podcast. I'm trying to say that three times and not screw it up. Hi, this is Dan Infold from HuntingBeast.com. You're about to listen to one of my favorite podcasts, Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Jay, and I'm hanging out here in my studio while Dusty is in his studio, and we're psyched to be back on the air, bringing you what we believe is going to be one of the most interesting podcasts we've done all year. We're going to be talking to Laura Zira from Naked and Afraid. She's uh, super interesting, and she's got some knowledge there, Jay, that you know not everybody's got. So I think that we're going to dig into a little bit about survival. And I don't want to spill the beans right here, though. But yeah, just hanging out in the studio with everybody. And thanks again for tuning in with us every week, man. We appreciate that. Just a true blessing to be here, Jay, really. Completely agree. I hope you're tuning in on iTunes as usual. And please subscribe and leave us a review if you are. I do want to let everybody know that I am going to be down at the Trinity Sportsman's Outdoor Show coming up here in New Hampshire on April 1st. So if you're in New Hampshire, definitely come down and join me and take a look around. There's a lot of great vendors down there, a lot of great outdoors people from all over New Hampshire. So uh, again, Trinity Sportsman's Outdoor Show in Concord. Very cool, Jay. Should be a fun time. Come down and join Jay there at the sports show. Yes. Are you going to be anywhere, Dusty? Yeah, Jay, I'll be at the Ohio Deer and Turkey Expo in Columbus, Ohio, uh, probably Saturday, March the 18th when I'll roll into town. Uh, the expo's going March 17th, 18th, and 19th. So if you're headed up to Ohio Deer and Turkey Expo, shoot me an email, Dusty at BigBuckRegistry.com. I'd like to meet everybody who goes. Very cool. Yeah, and shoot me an email if you're going to be down at the Trinity Sportsman's Expo. I'm trying to line up a whole a s- series of interviews down there for the day. Shoot me an email if you'd like to jump on air with me and tell a good deer story or two. Also, our harness project is still in full effect. So if you receive in your tree stand that you get one of those prepackaged free tree stand harnesses and you want to donate to the cause, just send it to us by emailing us, jay at bigbuckregistry.com or dusty at bigbuckregistry.com. I want to play some clips for you of what we did with Laura live on Facebook on Thursday. I took out some of the best clips that I could find, and I want to play them back for us right now. Yeah, let's do I'm it. really excited to be here. I just regret not having a mustache as epic as Dusty. <laughs> it, uh, that's it awesome. Is, uh, so what do you think about that, her little comment about your mustache? Uh, you know, the mustache, uh, it's... Uh... It has come and gone, Jay. No longer available. No longer. All right, you get rid, get rid of it. All right, here's the next clip. Have you ever been attacked by a wild animal? Um, I had a, a little struggle with a civet in Asia. It's kind of an animal that's a cross between a cat and a raccoon. But I asked for that. Like, I was definitely trying to catch it by hand. And 
that that was the only time I've ever had um, kind of a negative altercation. But I mean, I've been face to face with grizzly bears, sharks, crocodiles. I mean, everything. And I've certainly I've never had an experience where I didn't deserve what I got. So I don't know what a civet is, but it sounds pretty pretty gnarly. Interesting that she's been in situations where things got aggressive. Yeah, and she but she's not afraid of it. She's definitely not afraid. All right, let's right go. On. Let's go to the next clip. Great question from uh, Laura from Salt Lake City, Utah. Weirdest thing you've ever <laughs> eaten. Weirdest, I'm not sure. Grossest was tarantula. Um, I had a tarantula in Colombia. I don't know if I didn't cook it right, but it was tastes like burnt plastic. It was awful. <laughs> So eating a tarantula tastes like burnt plastic, and I don't, I don't really want to know what the rest of that tastes like, but she, here's what she says about burnt plastic. <laughs> What's burnt plastic taste like? Um, I don't know, kind of like a bad perm. I don't know gotcha. what a bad perm tastes like, but that's what it smells like. So it's, a tarantula t- tastes like a burnt plastic, and burnt plastic smells and tastes like a bad perm. Yeah, perm stinks on its own. Right. right. I agree. All right, here's the next clip. So you're you're out in the wild and filming is over. What's that first shower feel like when you get get back to civilization? Never gets old. Oh my god, <laughs> love it. I mean, hot water, right? It feels so good. Yeah, I mean, it's right. the fact that you know. I mean, I'm pretty clean when I'm out there. You bathe every day, but hot water, oh, awesome. Do you have soap when you're out in the, out in the, the wild? So I like to exfoliate with sand. Usually you can find like pretty coarse sand. Um, but as far as soap goes, if you're lucky enough to be in an area where there's plants that have uh, what's saponin in it, that you can actually lather them up and it um, creates kind of like a soap. It's not anything as amazing as what we're used to, but it still gets you clean. So pretty, pretty interesting. I mean, it reminds me after a week of uh, like turkey or deer camp, no matter where you go, the first thing that you kind of think of is, hey, I need a shower. Yeah, no doubt, man. It's uh, definitely a feeling of a shower that uh, you just like, wow. Yeah, here's the next clip. Favorite way to start a primitive fire? Um, I think that the it depends. If I don't have a lot of material, then um, hand drills are super easy to make. But a bow drill, you can have more variables. And, you know, if it's raining, uh, it's going to be really hard to get a hand drill. Bow drills, you can have a lot of things go wrong. And you can still power through it and make it work. So old reliable, probably the bow drill. All right, so we're going to the bow drill if you get stuck in the woods. Forget about the other stuff. Make a bow drill if you have the utensils. And then finally, here's the last clip. And I think this this one kind of tells you all about Laura's spirit. Andrea Bierman asks, what or who inspires you? I love people who have gone through, who have like been dealt bad cards and are optimists and make amazing things happen in their lives anyway. I'm just really inspired by people who can have optimism in the face of, of challenge. Optimism in the face of challenge. So that, I think that kind of sums up what Laura looks at in life. So she's just a real positive person, and I cannot wait to get to this interview. So let's let's go there. But before we get there, let's turn to Jim Keller with the Deer News. For the Big Book Registry, this is Jim Keller with the Deer News. Our first story this week, baiting bill could change deer hunting in Alabama. This story was originally featured on the Montgomery Advertiser website and was reported by Marty Roney. A bill working its way through the Alabama legislature could bring major changes to deer season in the state. Hunting generates a $1.8 billion yearly economic impact in Alabama, according to the Hunting Heritage Foundation. White-tailed deer is the most popular game animal in the state, according to the Alabama Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. The bill will allow hunters to use bait for deer and feral hogs. Current law allows hunters to use supplemental feed, called bait by most folks, if the feed source is at least 100 yards away from the hunter and out of the direct line of sight. This bill does away with the distance and view requirement, but adds a twist. Each hunter who wants to hunt over bait will be required to buy a $15 yearly license for the privilege. The bait license will be in addition to buying a hunting license. Anyone exempt from buying a hunting license is not exempt from buying the bait license, the bill reads. Of the bait license fee, $14 will be returned to the Conservation Department, with $1 being an administrative fee for the issuing of the license. It is estimated that the annual license will raise between $1.2 and $1.5 million for the Conservation Department. The bill also is a supplement to the current baiting law. It doesn't replace it. In other words, if hunters want to abide by the requirements that bait must be 100 yards away and out of the line of sight, they don't have to purchase a $1,500 yearly bait license. The bill passed the House Tuesday and heads to the Senate for consideration. 2016 Iowa Deer Harvest Tops 100,000 This information is from the Iowa Department of Natural Resources website. 
deer hunters reported harvesting 101,397 deer during the 2016 Iowa deer hunting season, which is about 3,000 fewer than were reported in 2015, but nearly identical to the 2014 harvest. Hunters participating in the early deer seasons battled unseasonably warm weather, a significant factor that likely contributed to the lower overall harvest. Hunters in the early muzzleloading season reported 600 fewer deer, and youth hunters reported 400 fewer deer than the 2015 season. The Iowa DNR has a goal to manage for a deer population that can provide a harvest of between 100,000 and 120,000 deer each year based on the recommendations agreed upon by the State Deer Task Force. This State Deer Task Force continues to meet annually prior to any deer season or license quota recommendations are proposed. New Hampshire gun owners no longer need license to carry concealed weapon. This story was originally featured on the Fox News Insider website. In the state of New Hampshire, it's now legal to carry a concealed loaded gun without a license. Republican Governor Chris Sununu signed a bill into law eliminating the concealed carry license requirement for pistol and revolver owners. It was the first bill he signed since taking office. Under the new law, anyone who can legally possess a gun under state and federal law can carry it concealed in a purse, car, or briefcase without a license. It is common sense legislation, the governor said as he announced the law. This is about making sure that our laws on our books are keeping people safe while remaining true to the live free or die spirit. New Hampshire is already an open carry state and the new law makes a concealed carry license optional rather than mandatory. According to the National Rifle Association, New Hampshire is the 12th state to enact such a policy. Before the law, anyone who wanted to carry their gun concealed had to apply for a license with the local police officials who would decide if they were quote-unquote suitable for one. Detractors said this system was too subjective. In New Hampshire, the Second Amendment is your concealed carry permit. Editorial. New Hampshire has joined 11 other states with the passing of their constitutional concealed carry law. The other 11 states are Alaska, Arizona, Arkansas, Idaho, Kansas, Maine, Mississippi, Missouri, Vermont, West Virginia, and Wyoming. In addition, Montana, New Mexico, and Oklahoma have limited forms of permitless concealed carry laws. 31 states allow the open carrying of a handgun without any license, although in some cases the gun must be unloaded. 15 states require some form of license or permit in order to openly carry a handgun. I find it ironic that there are so many laws and rules around the carrying of weapons for law-abiding citizens. Does someone think that all these rules and laws will cause a bad guy to think twice about whether they carry a weapon or not? Since we're all good guys and gals, make sure you check the laws in any state before you decide to openly or conceal your weapon, as the laws do vary from state to state, and some apply only to citizens of those states. And let us know by email or posting on our Facebook page how you feel about laws related to carrying weapons. That concludes this week's edition of the Big Buck Registry's Deer News. For links to the stories featured this week, please check out our show notes at www.bigbuckregistry.com. If you have any ideas for future topics or have questions about any of these topics, please email me at jim at bigbuckregistry.com. For the Big Buck Registry, this is Jim Keller with the Deer News. Thanks to Jim Keller for the Deer News. Without further ado, here's Laura Zira from Naked and Afraid. Laura Zira, welcome to the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. How are you, my friend? I am great. Thank you so much for having me. Psyched out. It was a complete random chance that we met in Las Vegas back during the shot show. And uh, we were with our friend Josh Carney, and he picked the table, and you were sitting there. And lo and behold, <laughs> you sat next to my good friend Dusty. And Dusty, who is extremely talented at making friends quickly. Yes, that is what I love about shot show, is you never know who you're going to end up sitting next to at dinner. Yep. And he noticed that when you exchanged numbers that you had a 603 area code, which happens to be the exact same area code that I have on my phone. So instantly we bonded. We both knew that we were from New Hampshire. Bonded yeah, out, right? New Hampshire's a small town. It really is. I want to hear all about the show you're on, Naked and Afraid. Yeah. Super crazy. crazy. Totally weird. Yeah, so we got to get into that. And then we couldn't help but notice, and certainly as we were discussing at the table in Vegas, that you've got this kind of hunting thing going on. Yes. I mean, I hunt in New Hampshire with a traditional bow, although I my favorite is to hunt in Australia where there's six different species of deer. There aren't specific seasons and there aren't regulations as far as how you can hunt them. So, Laura, tell me about you. Where are you from? Where did you grow up? What was life like as a kid? Yeah, um, I was actually born in western Massachusetts. Really normal, very nice family. 
not a hunting family, not even a fishing family. Uh, we used to go on hikes occasionally, and that was kind of the extent of things. But I was just a weird kid. I loved being out in the woods. I wanted to be out there as much as possible. I used to stalk deer and sleep in coyote dens, and I was just really drawn to being outside. And okay. the older I got, the more frustrated I got that I was kind of like this alien that would be out there observing this world that was going on, but then I'd have to go home for supper and go home and sleep in a bed. And then, you know, I could visit again, but I felt this huge disconnect. So I wanted to learn how to be more of an animal and exist in that world in a more real way. And that's kind of where my inspiration for becoming a survivalist came was I wanted to learn how to meet my needs out there. I wanted to figure out how to go out there and find my own food, find my own shelter and survive like the animals I loved watching. That was really where it all started. Gotcha. So you're a self-proclaimed weird kid. Totally weird kid. <laughs> Misfit. What? So did you have friends like in, in high school that, that, that you could do the survivalist kind of stuff with or were you on your own? I mean, I was a super nerd in school. Okay. Um, I had friends, but I kind of had this weird dual world, right? Go to school and smile and dress pretty. And then I would <laughs> go home after school and, you know, take off my nice clothes and throw on something junky and go and like climb through a swamp, you know, and occasionally I would get a friend to go with me. Usually it was only once because they're parents would get picked off that they came home, you know, missing a shoe and covered in dirt. So um, it was something that I just really enjoyed doing by myself. I mean, I would have loved to do it with other people, but um, it didn't always work out that way. And it didn't necessarily matter to me. It was where I felt most at home and most alive, really. Right. Gotcha. I think we have some stuff in common. I don't know if it's just just the way New Hampshire (laughs) raises their kids or what. You know, and I love that. I love, you know, when I was young, I really felt like there was nobody else like me in the world. And I didn't know anyone else that was like me. And I thought I was going to go through life as this weird hermit. And uh, it turns out the world is full of people who are crazy like us. And it makes me really happy because I feel like the more I explore the the world, the more I meet these people. And the more I'm like, all right, that's that's cool. I'm not alone. There are people with that are my type of crazy. Yeah, it's funny because when, you know, it kind of was the preppy jock, you know, the... You know, the, try try to hang out with the the popular crowd, and uh, but when nobody was looking, I'd disappear into the woods and I'd put on my <laughs> my work boots and my my blue mm-hmm. jeans and a white t shirt, and I'd grab a fishing pole and I'd go wading up to my neck in miry brook, and I'd go catch as many native brook trout as I could get my hands on, and I'd do it all the time and. You couldn't explain that to somebody that was in that preppy clique because they didn't understand why the heck you'd want to go get all muddy and dirty and go into some place that smelled like a swamp and just hung out. Absolutely. That's the best. I mean, I feel like if we knew each other when we were younger, we would have totally secretly hung out. I completely agree. We would have, we would have been doing that and, and nobody understood it except for there. I had a couple of friends that did it with me on occasion, but for the most part, I could not find anybody to do anything, but you know, throw a baseball around a diamond most of the time. I think the coolest thing about survival becoming um, a mainstream thing is that more and more I talk to kids and younger people and people are getting out more. It seems then, you know, maybe it's just my perspective on the world that's changed, but I feel like kids are getting out more and you you see these kids running around with their little bear girl survival knives and it's like they're inspired and they want to go out and they want to, you know, even if it's just for an afternoon. I mean, you can see the other side of that and I think it's still you know, the technology is still an issue and there's, there's kids that are going to that. But I do like to think that survival becoming popular is having a, a positive impact on, on kids getting out there. Good. Now we talk about doing this as kids, but mm-hmm. it turns out you did it as an adult um, and did it in front of a <laughs> camera. And I still do it today. In fact, I was out coyote hunting this afternoon uh, as a, yeah. right, right after work. I changed out of my, my suit and I got into my hunting clothes and went right out into the deepest swamp and stepped into something that I thought was frozen and wasn't, but it didn't matter. I kept going. And, you know, <laughs> so I'm still doing that as an adult, much as you did um, on camera mm-hmm. for, for the entire world to see. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's something that the the older I got, the more I thought maybe I'd have to give up what I love doing and get, you know, a real job. And I feel really blessed in that I've been able to continue doing what I'm doing, perhaps because of my stubbornness, but, 
you know, for as, for as long as I have. I mean, I feel like even when I'm in, you know, this world, I still try to get out as much as I can. I try to get out at least once a day and go somewhere where I can't hear the cars anymore. And, you know, I, I get that solitude of nature and, um, yeah, I'm I'm really lucky in that sometimes people want to watch and there's a camera crew following me and it's totally weird. <laughs> it is kind of weird, but kind of cool too. In some but kind of like really cool yeah. for sure, really cool. So tell me about the the show itself, uh, Naked and Afraid. Uh, let's kind of start at the beginning because there's some people that are listening to the show that haven't watched the show, but I guarantee you're going to go try to find some some playbacks on some streaming. What? Tell me about yeah. how that so, all came uh, to to be. Right. So Naked and Afraid is a show on Discovery Channel, and it basically the, the premise of the show is that two strangers go out, they each get to bring an item, and they get stripped of their clothes, meet for the first time naked in some remote location, and have to survive 21 days of complete full survival. So I was in Panama, the Amazon, and then I did a 40-day um, Naked and Afraid XL experience in Colombia. And I didn't know that when they were first contacting me, I was actually the second episode to ever be filmed. So the show hadn't obviously gone to air. No one knew about it. And I got a random phone call and my, I used to teach survival all around the country. So when they were casting, they actually kept running into my name when they were calling these different survival schools. There's not a, a ton of women in the industry. My name kept coming up. They called me up and, uh, it was hunting season. So they wanted me to fly out to LA and I was really <laughs> resistant. Um, but they finally convinced me to go out and um, audition, and uh, I had no idea what I was getting into. But later, I was taking my clothes off on a deserted island off the coast of Panama and meeting a, a naked stranger. So it, it happened really fast, and um, I haven't looked back since. It, it kind of uh, it was a really good experience. Gotcha. But, okay. But so yeah, a little weird. So you're you, you're into the survivalist teaching basically so you're you're a survivalist uh, by nature and yeah. so, so you're into teaching how to do this as well so your name just kind of came up on and google searches frequently it sounds like and then they, they, mm-hmm. they there was somebody in probably los angeles trying to concoct a a, a scheme that would be good on television and mm-hmm. came up with their premise put probably pitched their show and said now we've got to find some people and your name Yes. Pop to the top of the chart. So they said, so what was that conversation like when they were trying to reach out to you? How did that go? I mean, first of all, there was no credentials. There was no, you know, let me see your badge to show me you're really part of this production company. I was almost wondering if it was someone just playing a prank on me. And then when they said they wanted to send me a ticket, I was like, okay, great. You know, they sent me a ticket to LA and I'm flying to LA and I'm thinking, oh man, there could be anyone waiting for me when I get off this plane. You know, I I don't know who's picking me up. I have, you know, no, it could be an elaborate ploy. Um, You know, I'm going to be sold into slavery somewhere. And it it was really weird. I got taken to this hotel room and, uh, you know, it turned out to be legit. Thank God. Because, you know, I've I've done stupid things in my life and I've gotten away with them. And that that would have been a bummer. But um, (laughs) yeah, it was, uh, it it went well and it, it just all happened really fast. Gotcha. So I went from phone call to plane ride to hotel room to let's ship you off to some foreign land and uh, see if you can hang out and, and actually make it for a few days. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It was that very was weird. The premise of the show, Naked and Afraid, and then I got to figure this out. Why naked? Why naked? Yeah. Everyone wants to know why naked. I mean, when you think about it, clothing is your first line of shelter. So when you take that away, you are exposed you know, physically and also mentally, it is so, it just strips you of everything. And it, you you go out there and when it rains and you don't even have a t-shirt on, you know, it's cold. I mean, 70 degrees feels freezing cold when you're naked and the bugs can bite you everywhere. So it just takes everything up a level. I mean, you have the, the mental aspect of it for sure. People are not used to being naked and certainly it's weird when there's, you know, a full camera crew that's fully clothed, but it's something you forget about that part of it because the immediate thing that happens is you realize how serious it is because you need to start meeting your needs. You don't even have anything on your body to protect you. So it just, it makes everything that much harder. And it's also really interesting. I mean, who is going to be flipping through the channels and see something called Naked and Afraid and not want to tune in? I mean, right. it's brilliant marketing. <laughs> yeah, it, it definitely. It, it, it sells the television show right away. I no question about it. For mm-hmm. some just wanted to, they were thinking about tuning in. Yeah, I've got to look at that. I'm not sure why they're naked or why they're afraid, but I'm, I'm in. Right. 
<laughs> yeah, wow. Exactly. But I do understand the whole naked part. I mean, you you are completely exposed. So as yeah, as you as you land, you, your first job is to go find clothing. Is that is that kind of what you're what you're thinking at that point? Um, you know, actually, I I found out pretty quickly that there's a reason that um, you know, a lot of indigenous people uh, in tropical areas don't necessarily wear clothes and. Unless you have an animal hide right off the bat to work with, um, trying to make clothes with uh, plant materials. I mean, you think uh, the idea of a grass skirt sounds awesome. Mm-hmm. So you have this grass skirt, and it dries out as you know grass does when it dries, and the wind blows, and all of a sudden you're getting paper cuts in places that I don't want to talk about. <laughs> so right, okay. uh, clothing was actually uh, more of a hindrance than a help. Um, but the first thing for sure is is shelter. So building some kind of shelter so that if it rains you can get out of it because you can get hypothermic and die in a matter of hours. Even if it's a tropical area, the temperatures can drop. And if you are cold at the beginning of the night, as the temperature continues to drop and you continue to be wet, it can turn real serious real fast. So shelter is definitely number one priority. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Speaking of the skill set that you have, I'm interested in learning more about how you develop those. How did you get your skills? What what helped you? Where did, where did you learn how to do all this stuff? Well, I um, I really, I'm 31 years old. So when I first started out, it was, you know, the internet wasn't what it is now. And I really wanted to learn stuff, but I didn't know anyone. I didn't know where to turn. So I really did a lot of trial and error and I learned by failure. And I kind of had this philosophy, the greater the need, the greater the result. So I would put myself in these crazy situations that, um, you know, started out pretty mild by my standards now, but got more and more intense. And when you're out there and your only option is to figure it out, it's amazing how innate some of this stuff is. It's incredible how, how much of it is just common sense. And if you get in the right mindset and you start to realize, you know, the first thing is realizing what your basic needs are and then trying to figure out how to meet those needs. So it, you know, you start out and it's pretty rough and uncomfortable, but the more you learn, the more you figure out, then the more comfortable you get. So it was a lot of trial and error. I mean, I did meet people in my travels that, had different skill sets. And I was lucky enough when I was in uh, college, actually, my ethnobotany teacher grew up in Venezuela with uh, a tribe. His dad is an anthropologist. So he taught me how to uh, build primitive bows and primitive arrows and got me started on my primitive hunting path. And, um, you know, there's certain skills I, I learned, there's certain tips I picked up. And really, the majority of it was just messing up a lot having nights where I was really cold and really hungry and then saying, I never want to be in that position again. How can I prevent that from happening? What did I learn? And, and pushing through it. So a lot of a self taught is what you're saying. Yes. Gotcha. What? Yeah. Give us one uh, memory where it was a miserable night and, and how did you change it? Um, the first night I went out and decided to build a debris shelter. So a debris shelter is a really basic shelter usually um kind of looks like a little mini a-frame and you you know you can make it very easily out of sticks and then you pile leaves on top and really simple it's like building a fort when you're a kid you know so i go out and i build what i think is this great shelter and i'm really excited to spend the night and there's you know a forecast for a light drizzle and i go out and i don't bring a flashlight because that's my philosophy is if i have a flashlight then i can walk home if i don't have a flashlight well i'm going to stay out here so, you know, night falls and I'm all comfortable in my little shelter and the, you know, night gets, it goes on and I start to get a little bit colder, but I'm like, I got this. And it, it wasn't the middle of the winter or anything, you know, I mean, it was, it was probably early September. And so, um, all of a sudden this, this light drizzle starts falling and I'm laying there like, oh, my shelter's working. This is great. I'm not getting wet. I got this. And then the rain continues to fall. And I learned pretty quickly that you need so much more material on there than you think. So you actually need like three plus feet of material on top of you to divert the rain enough that it's not going to come through and get you wet. And I had maybe a foot. And after about 15 minutes of it raining, I was completely soaked and freezing cold and I couldn't get back. And I, you know, I shivered my way through the night and I swore I'd never do that again. So I learned really quick. All right. Always overbuild things because you know, when you have the light and you can do that, you're not going to be doing it at night, especially when you're cold. Gotcha. So that, that was your first experience out. Um, it was probably my second night ever out. I had one good night that got my confidence up and, um, (laughs) I'm pretty sure that was the second night I'd ever, I ever spent out without a tent. Gotcha. How, How did you prepare yourself to say, Hey, I'm going out 
and I'm going by myself and I'm going to stay out there. What, what did you do mentally to ready yourself? I mean, I think it was just this great desire that I had. It was like, it was just something that I wanted to do. I didn't go camping when I was a kid. Um, I think I slept out in a tent in the backyard maybe twice. Um, and probably didn't make it through the whole night because I was too young. <laughs> so it was it was kind of a, a trial by fire, but it was it was just something I wanted so bad, you know. And I had spent so much time out in the woods otherwise that I was just I wasn't scared of anything out there. And so um, you know, I just I just wanted it. Gotcha. How long did it take before it, you felt like you had enough experience by yourself to think that you know you're a successful survivor in the outdoors? Oh, I mean, I'm still convincing myself. <laughs> I think, I think, um, you know, one of the, the, the biggest things I can do to ever humble myself to go out and have these experiences again and again and again, because there's always something new I learn. And even though, you know, it's probably a couple of years before I started feeling like I was getting it, but there's still times when I go out where I'm like, all right, yep, definitely learned something there. Definitely not going to do that again. And it's, that's what I love about surviving in the wild is that there's always ways to make it harder. There's always a new environment and there's always, you know, a different twist on things that could happen. Um, and so it's always a new challenge and I'm always learning. And I love that about it is I never feel like I'm going to be like, oh, I have this 100 percent. You know, it's it's always something that's teaching me. Gotcha. OK, yeah, that makes sense. And I'm sure that you learn. You learn every time you get in a survival situation. Is that correct? Yes. Every single time. Gotcha. OK. Is yeah. anybody like friends or family? Who's somebody you can learn from? That's a great question. I mean, I feel like every person does it a little bit differently. So sometimes I'll go out with, you know, friends I've met in the survival community and I definitely, yeah, we all do it differently. Some people will have little tricks and you, you'll watch them. And you're like, why do you do that? I'm always learning. I mean, I think I love going out if I'm in a new place, like going out in Australia and seeing how indigenous people live there and learning tricks from them. I mean, there's certain things that you only learn when you have a history on a piece of land. And so going out and, you know, having them know, all right, well, when this flower is blooming, this certain kind of fish is feeding in this certain kind of way in this body of water. And there's stuff like that, that you would never know if you just traveled in a landscape, but people who have lived and have a connection with a certain piece of land, I think that's, that's who I can really, really learn stuff from. And it can be someone, you know, whose family lived for a couple generations on the same piece of land in, you know, Ohio, let's say, <laughs> but there's always something um, that you can only learn from, from being in one spot. So that's, that's probably, I like talking to people who are, who are native to a piece of land. Gotcha. That that makes sense. Then it, it definitely you learn to uh, just speaking from experience. When I was in New Hampshire, you know, them guys sent me on my own, and and I'm not used to big woods, and it mm -hmm. was uh, it was definitely a, a unique experience, scary, but I learned a lot for sure. I I could go there oh, now. Yeah. I could go there now and be comfortable. And it it took me a few attempts uh, going mm -hmm. into the big woods to to lay it out mentally in my mind to be able to to return myself back to the starting point. And that, that's something that it, it did. It took me probably the fourth or fifth time being out there to, to finally set in that it's different than Ohio. Ohio's flat, you know, a few acres of woods mm -hmm. here and there, but uh, you get in a big woods, you get, it's intimidating to start out with. And then it's definitely uh, overwhelming with all the visual takings that you're run into along the way. But I'm going to run through kind of like a list of questions for survival situation Let's say we're going out on a journey. We get lost in the wilderness. What's the first four steps? Absolute first thing I would do is build a shelter. And it doesn't matter if you're, just, you know, you, you getting dark and you think that you're not going to find a way out. I mean, start building a shelter because it's way easier to just stay there, spend the night, um, you know, be warm, make it through, than try to wander around through the dark. You know, anyone who's ever been out longer than they thought and are trying to make their way back in the dark, it it not only is really difficult and frustrating, but you can get really hurt that way. You know, it's, it can be really dangerous. Yeah. Build a shelter first and foremost and make it as intense as you possibly can. A lot of people immediately start thinking about food in a survival situation because we're so trained that we need these three meals a day, but that's, what's going to kill you last. That's the absolute last thing I think about building a shelter. Absolutely. If you have time, I mean, to build a good shelter, if you realize that you're lost and it's, you know, two o'clock in the afternoon and you only have a few hours of, of daylight left, 
that's absolutely what you need to spend the rest of your time doing. Um, you know, you can go three days without water. So yeah, you need to worry about that, but not right away. But build your shelter 100%. And then, you know, waking up the next day, I mean, I've been, I've been turned around in the woods before. I've had to spend the night out there. And um, I always try to, you know, if I think I can get out and it's not going to be a long, I've never had to camp out for, you know, 30 days because I couldn't find my way out. I normally start trying to walk the next day and I normally try to find some kind of body of water. And, you know, we all know water like to run down and streams join bigger streams and those bigger streams join rivers. So um, that's usually a good way. Rivers usually eventually end up following um, or going to civilization. So that would be that would be my game plan. What uh, choosing a shelter site, how, how important is that? Super important. Yeah, definitely. Like you don't want to be in a gully where the second it rains, you're going to get flooded out. Um, you want to be somewhere. A lot of people think they want to be in the middle of a really deep, thick patch of woods. Well, if you're spending the night there, that's fine. But, you know, a lot of times those places have ground that's wet and cold all the time. But you don't want to be too out in the open either, because then if a storm does come and you have a shelter that's made of leaves, the leaves are all going to blow away. So it's all about finding that happy medium. Like I try to set up my shelter, you know, whether it's long-term or temporary, kind of on those edge zones, you know, the same way animals like edge zones. Edge zones are great to to be to, to camp out on because you have that, um, it's, it's the least extreme. You, you're not in the extreme dark, wet depths and you're not um, fully exposed. It's, it's going to dry out more because it's going to get some sun, but you know, you're going to have some protection from the wind. So that's really important. And if you think you're going to be there for at least a couple of days, you really want your water source to be close by as well. Gotcha. What's your most important survival tool that you would pack with you? A knife, hands down. Any situation, um, you can get by without anything else. Um, if you don't have a knife, anyone who's ever tried to survive using stone tools will tell you it is the worst thing. It just makes everything so much harder. And you can do it, but it sucks. So if you have a knife out there, it has a million uses. And it is, you know, it makes everything easier. You can make a shelter. You can, you know, get fire. You can meet all the rest of your needs just by having that one item with you. Best survival tip. Best survival tip is, is definitely just to have the right attitude going in. Um, the moment you start to panic, the moment you freak out and think, oh, no, this is, this is really bad. I'm lost. I'm in trouble. Um, your, your odds of survival start going down. And it's easier said than done because when you're really out there, that fear is real. And we don't learn how to deal with that fear anymore. We don't ever have to deal with that in our normal lives. So being able to sit back, you know, if I was lost, I would tell someone the first thing you should probably do, even before building a shelter, is sit down for a minute and just take a few breaths and use that fear to get to work as opposed to just panic and try to get yourself out of the situation. And as hunters, I feel like a lot of us have been in that situation where you have that moment where you're like, oh no, wait, which direction? Like I, you get so into the moment and you're tracking a deer and you get completely turned around and I mean, it, it can be really scary and that's when people make mistakes. You know, you'll, you'll find people who have literally walked themselves in circles so many times that they're covered in sweat and then night falls and the temperature drops and they freeze to death because, you know, they're, they're soaking wet now and their clothes are soaking wet and, um, you know, it can, it can get dangerous. So being calm and having your actions be, you know, just really well thought out. And even if you're working hard, just having those actions be non-panicked. It's so important to have a good mental state. Is there any, any way that you can prep yourself mentally for a scenario like being lost or stranded in a wilderness? I mean, I think that's one of the, the beautiful things about uh, people learning survival skills is they start to, or even if you just read about it or you know, think about it or research it. When you start to understand it more and, you know, you, you can kind of transform things from I have to survive this horrible night in the woods to, oh, I have to build a temporary home for the night. So the more you know, really, it's not even about the actual facts that you know. It's about having that confidence because you think you know something. So if you're completely oblivious and you've, you've never heard the first thing about survival and you get lost, that fear is going to be more real and you're going to have more of a reason to be afraid. Um, and building that confidence through knowledge is huge in my eyes. Gotcha. makes sense. It definitely makes sense to yeah. have some knowledge before you get in that, that situation. All right. Do you have any medical background, Laura? I've done wilderness 
first aid, and um, that's about it. I'm not a I'm not an EMT or anything like that. Basic knowledge. What's probably the most important basic knowledge of medical field that you would need to know in a survival situation? I mean, I think it's just knowing when to when to make a move. I mean, prevention is obviously huge. Even if you're the most skilled, trained doctor, if you're way out in the backcountry, there's only so many things you can do. I mean, knowing how to treat bleeds, sprains, your basic wounds that you're going to need, knowing how to make a splint and being able to make a splint that you can actually walk out on, really basic stuff. Because any knowledge you have more than that, I mean, if, you don't, if you're not in the right setting, you're not really going to need to know how to use it. So, um, yeah, your basic stuff, I would say bleeding, um, knowing how to diagnose the concussion, basic um, how to deal with snake bites, certain countries that you're in. Um, there's actually ways you can really um, increase your odds of surviving a very venomous snake bite. Really basic stuff. And you have that confidence that when you're in that situation. But I mean, also having a having a plan B, having a, a satellite phone with you in that situation can, can be life or death. That makes complete sense. Uh, as far as having that lifeline, that's something that's mm-hmm. more often overlooked, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'm, I'm guilty of it. I totally will go out and not have a, a sat phone on me. And it's a calculated risk. It's a risk I know I'm taking. And there's certain things where if something happened to me way out in the backcountry and I have no way of, of alerting anyone, I mean, I realize that I'm going to be in trouble. But it's, it's a calculated risk for sure. Gotcha. Let's get in a little bit about water and how to purify water. Can you touch bases a little bit about uh, when you know that you got safe drinking water? Yeah. Pretty much any water that you're going to find out in the wild, you should boil. Um, you, there's ways of filtering it, but there's there's certain bacteria that can get through a basic filter. So boiling is the only way that you're going to know how to how to treat that. I mean, I've I've gone out, and I probably shouldn't admit to this. I've gone out on you know treks for a few weeks out in the mountains in Idaho, and um, you know, haven't treated any of my water, and I've been fine. But the problem is, is that if you do get giardia and you're out. Um, I've also had Giardia. And when you're out in a backcountry situation, it seems like it would just be an inconvenience, but it's actually crippling. And if you can't get out to, to get food, to you know, you can't even get to the stream to get water, um, it's pretty scary. So, you know, I, I think after getting Giardia, I, uh, I started thinking more about making sure I boiled all my water. Um, you don't always need a pot to do it if you don't have a, a metal container. One of my favorite things to do is rock boiling. Um, and you take a, you can make a container out of bark. You can make it out of a, you know, an old, um, I've made them out of uh, water buffalo horns in Outback Australia, some kind of vessel that's going to hold water. And you take rocks and you put them in the fire and you heat them up. And then you take the rocks and you put them inside the vessel. And once you get enough rocks in there, it'll transfer the heat and the water will actually come to a boil. That's a, that's a good little, little boiling water hack that I love using. Yeah. Boil your water for sure. Unless you find a water vine or, you know, some, some place where you know your water's pure, uh, a spring that you know is a spring. Otherwise always boil. How do you prepare yourself for navigation as far as uh, north, south, east, and west? Is there anything that you can tell us that uh, will help you in your direction capabilities? I mean, definitely knowing, you know, here in the northern hemisphere, when we look up at the sun, um, knowing just the simple fact that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west and is generally going to be in the southern part of the sky. If you have sun and you can look at that, I mean, you're, you're in a lot of shit. Like, people get freaked out and want to learn how to navigate by stars. And chances are, unless there's a full moon, you're not going to be moving at night anyway. Even if it's a cloudy sky, you can generally tell where the sun is. So what I always do if I'm going into a big tract of land, I'll take a really basic look at a map and I'll say, all right, I know that if I walk far enough to the south on this piece of land, you know, it might be 10 miles, it might be 20 miles, whatever it is, I know that I'm going to get to a road eventually. And then I know that if I'm in this situation and I get turned around, it might suck. I might have blisters on my feet by the time I'm done. But if I walk generally south, I know that I'm going to get out. So that's just something really simple and basic. There was a woman who was hiking on the Appalachian Trail, and she ended up spending 30 days uh, about a mile off the trail. She got turned around when she went to the bathroom, couldn't find her way back, and she ended up passing away right inside the trail. If someone had taught her just basically how to walk in one direction, it would have saved her life. So that's just a trick that if I could have everyone do one thing, that would be it. And if it's nighttime, don't start running around trying to find your way out. Just just settle in for the night and try again in the morning. I've known people to walk off cliffs because they were trying to navigate at night. And 
it sounds impossible, but when you're in that panic state and you're, you're trying to move, it's, it's easier said than done. Then all of a sudden you're in the middle of nowhere. You have no idea where you are. You have a broken ankle and that's, that's not a good situation. Knowing that you've been on naked and afraid, what's the most dangerous animal that you've encountered? Well, the most dangerous animal. Um, I mean, I think that to be totally honest, I've, I've been around people who, um, don't have awareness around snakes. And while snakes are, you know, the sweetest creatures who don't want to hurt you, um, if you aren't paying attention in certain environments, that's probably the quickest way to injury, to potentially fatal injury. I've had to pull people back as they were a foot away from stepping on brown snakes, which are one of the most venomous snakes in the world. Um, same with rattlesnakes. It's just that if you haven't grown up with snakes and you don't have to have that awareness towards where your feet are going, it's really easy to make that mistake. So I definitely think um, in certain situations, that's that's probably the most dangerous. I mean, I've, I've swam with sharks. I've gotten really close to crocodiles. I've been face-to-face with grizzlies. But I would say that, that snakes, you know, every time you step on a snake, it's going to try to beat you. So that's it's probably the one people have to think about the most. One more question for me before I turn you back over to Jay. When you go on a survival mm-hmm. adventure, do you tell family goodbye that there's a chance that you may not return? I hate goodbyes. <laughs> so no. Um, you know, if it happens, it happens. They know that, you know, I was happy. Probably not in that very moment, but <laughs> up until then, I hate goodbyes. <laughs> very good. Well, we've uh, covered quite a few questions there, and I think you answered them very thoroughly, Laura. Nice array of questions, Dusty. I'm, I'm very proud. I know. Very good. You know, I just wanted to cover the basics for the audience, and, and hopefully someday we'll get an email or uh, a message saying that, hey, you know, one of your guys' questions saved my life, and that, that's what it's all about here at the Big Buck Registry. I had a question about the uh, the, the, the knife. You said that you like bringing the knife uh, into the woods, one of your <laughs> favorite things uh, as a survivalist. What did you bring with you on the show? Were you, or let me back that up. Were you able to bring something with you? And was it a knife? Yes. All three times I brought a knife because I just would never want to be in that situation without it. It would be horrible. Okay. All right. So premise of the show is you get to bring one thing. And that was that was your choice. Mm-hmm. You mentioned that uh, you know, something about tracking deer as you're going through all the questions with Dusty. And I want to get into some of your hunting skills. It sounds like you've got some going back to your your childhood almost. I'm not sure, but I want to explore some of this. Stuff. Yeah. Because, of course, this is the Big Buck Registry Deer Hunting Podcast. We like to talk about hunting. Um, the survival of thing is fascinating to me. That's a whole aspect of life that, you know, <laughs> like, you have some of it as a hunter naturally. And certainly being in New Hampshire, the navigation skills are, you know, they're usually pretty high. If you're a hunter in New Hampshire, you kind of need that. Otherwise, a lot of people get lost. Mm-hmm. Um yeah. What about the hunting aspects of your life? Tell us about when did you start going hunting? And I mean, it sounds like you spent a lot of time in the outdoors, but when was your first introduction to hunting itself? So my first introduction was when I started building my own primitive boats. That was back in, I think, 2003. I, yeah, I, I actually went hunting with a boat before I went hunting with a gun. It was something that um, I just really wanted to, I really wanted to, uh, I was really passionate about tracking. That's kind of how it started. I wanted to get close to animals when I was younger. I spent a lot of time out there with them. And so I would, you know, learn their habits. I would learn, you know, where they would bed and where they would feed and how predictable they could be. And I loved, um, you know, going out and looking at tracks and making a prediction and then trying to see if I could verify if that was right or not. Like if I could um, somehow see that the animal was, you know, a decent sized buck or like a pregnant doe or whatever. And, um, you know, I used to set up sand out in the middle of the woods. I would clear all the, clear all the, uh, the leaves away. And I would, um, you know, I would make a little perfect area so that I could clearly see the tracks. And as time went on, I, I really got more into my tracking skills and, um, you know, I would see if I could, uh, find deer beds. I started becoming really obsessed with hunting for shed antlers. And just being able to predict where an animal was going to be at a specific time of year. Um, so it wasn't just during hunting season. It was all year round and learning how the behaviors changed and um, where they would move to and, um, you know, what different times of year and different hormonal cycles would, would do to the deer. And so that was just a passion even before I ever picked up, you know, something to, to kill the animal with. It was kind of a natural progression for me. I really wanted to, I started eating roadkill. Um, I learned how to skin and butcher and start eating roadkill because, okay. uh, because I really wanted to 
eat meat, but my uh, eat, eat wild meat, but my hunting skills weren't quite up to par yet. Yeah, and get, then I learned you gotta start from, somewhere, right? I mean, let's start with real. I got to start somewhere. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I started learning through um, my my ethnobotany professor, Manuel Zaraldi, who was an amazing hunter. Um, would build all of his own bows, make his own arrows, and um, he would go out hunting. And so I think when I first asked him to teach me, he probably thought I was a little bit crazy and, you know, not serious. But I, I really persisted and I really pushed him into, into teaching me. And I started learning more and more. And, you know, eventually I was I was traveling a lot and I was also working as a, a butcher and a taxidermist. I really wanted to get those skills down. So there were whole hunting seasons where I couldn't hunt because I had to be in the shop the whole time. Which was really hard because there was, I think, part of my ego that was involved in having to have proof that my skills were where I said they were. Even the years where I didn't hunt, it was still like I spent, I spent all, all my time. I mean, I'd go out tracking and it was just, it was, it was more about finding the animal. I mean, for me, it's as amazing as we all know, you know, how it is to kill this monster buck. It wasn't about that necessarily. It was about, it was about the hunt and it was about going out. I mean, I think most hunters that you talk to, it's, if you go out on opening day and your hunt's all of a sudden over because, you know, you take a shot and, and you fill your tag, it's like, you're excited, but it's almost disappointing because you don't get the experience. And I just became obsessed with the experience. And um, it's like a game, you know, you, mm -hmm. you think something and then it still would be amazing when you, you know, you succeed in your hunt. And so um, it was, it became like a lifestyle. Gotcha. Gotcha. You mentioned something in that, uh, the shed hunting. So you became obsessed with shed hunting. Where did you, yes. where did you shed hunt and, and what types of techniques and, and what types of things did you pick up of that you found useful and effective for finding sheds? Yeah. I mean, what I love about shed hunting is that when you go out, um, if you're going out and you're going after a deer, you know, when you, um, when you get close to it, it's, it, unless you see it first, it's going to take off. Right. And so there's this, you'd be walking blindly through the woods and spook a deer. And then you think that you were, um, you were on point and you may or may not have been actually tracking that deer. What I love about shed hunting is the sheds don't run away. So it actually makes it a little bit more difficult because you can walk right over one. And if your awareness isn't, isn't on point, if your eyes aren't trained to see something that's out of pattern with the landscape, then you can, I've literally seen people, my first shed I ever found, I was leading um, a tour in Arboretum at my college and I watched the person in front of me step on an antler and um, I was freaking out because I thought they were going to find it but it's like you have to have this kind of awareness but you also need to know animals well enough I mean there's massive tracks of wood but there's only there's only one area in there that the animal is most likely going to drop its antlers and so the more you get to know animals even the more you get to know a specific animal the more likely you are to find his antler so I just loved the um, the challenge of it. I uh, I started shed hunting in Connecticut when I was okay. um, in college there, and then um, I did it in Vermont and New Hampshire. Um, my favorite place is probably in between Idaho and uh, in Australia. I had the best shed hunting day of my life there. I found twenty seven antlers. It was it was magical. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, okay. that's a good day right there. Wow, that was a good day. Gotcha. So, what what types of styles of hunting do you enjoy these days? After you, you learned how to hunt, what styles did you start to adapt to? Well, I really, um, I really love primitive bow hunting because that's kind of where I started. Um, I switched over to rifle hunting um, for some time if I only had a limited amount of time, just to make sure that I had my freezer full. Yeah. But over the last few years, I got into something called persistence hunting. Um, which I learned how to do in Australia. And basically it works on the philosophy that as humans, the reason that we're hairless is because um, we can expel heat very easily. Okay. So the idea is that our ancestors, you know, they, they didn't have um, these, this technology that we have today. So in order to make, um, in order to get meat, the most very primitive basic way of hunting was actually running these animals down until they were so tired they couldn't run away from you anymore. So we might not be able to outrun a deer, but if you push a deer and push a deer and push a deer, they're not meant for long distances and eventually they will tire. And it's something that I didn't necessarily think was humanly possible. I kind of thought that we've all become civilized and soft, right. but in Australia, it's a forgiving terrain. Uh, even though it's, you know, hot and sparse, you can see the animals. You don't have to spend your time doubling back and figuring out if you're, you know, tracking properly. You can, you can see animals quite a distance away. 
So um, I started persistence hunting feral goats over there. I was totally hooked. Gotcha. The first time I succeeded, I just, I didn't think it was humanly possible. And um, it completely changed the way I, I saw hunting. And it, it felt like, you know, I'd reached my childhood goal of like wanting to, to be this feral animal out there. That's cool. So it's called persistence hunting. And, yeah. and you're usually yeah. gotten in tune with your natural biology and using mm-hmm. that to your advantage. I don't think anybody's ever really thought about it that way. It's, it sounds a little bit. No, like, I mean, it's, <laughs> it, it sounds, it sounds like it wouldn't be possible. And I mean, I tell you what, when you're in the New Hampshire woods and you're pushing through all that brush, I mean, you could step on a deer and not see it. Right. Because right. it's so thick and they're so amazing at blending in. But, you know, it's it's something where in a, a landscape like Australia or, you know, they did it in Africa, obviously, it's completely possible. And it's, you know, you don't have to run the entire time. Like you, when the animal walks, you walk. When the animal starts running, you pick up that jog and you just stay on it. And you start to notice when they start to get more tired. And, you know, eventually they're they're going to make a mistake. They're going to, you know, they're going to get tired. They're going to falter. And that's when you you put that last bit of speed and pressure on and it's not foolproof. I mean, I've, I've been skunked more times than I've had successes. That's for sure. And sometimes you're, you're running after this herd of goats for like six hours and all of a sudden they get this burst of energy from who knows where, and they take off into the distance. You're like, all right, cool. (laughs) See you guys. But it, it's it really it it pushes you, and I think it's it's also amazing because it puts you in that state where you just you know time is is not a thing. You're not thinking about time. You're not you know, you're, you're completely in your body. I love when when I reach that point. I I love that about survival too. It's like you get to this point where it's like you just really tap into that animal part that we all have in us. Gotcha. That, you know, it reminds me a lot of the the northern hunters that use the tracking style of hunting where you're using very lightweight clothing to go for a very, very long time on a deer track until you mm-hmm. get, get close enough where you can actually get off a shot. That sounds Absolutely. very similar, obviously not doing it naked because you're in the middle of, you know, some cold, cold, uh, snowy weather, but, right. but still it's the co- same concept. You're trying to keep your, you're moving so much and, and you know, you're going to sweat, you know, you're going to try to unload the heat as you move, but you try to wear very mm-hmm. lightweight wool or something that's very breathable so that you don't mm-hmm. overheat, but you're, you just keep going. You keep going until that animal yeah. makes a mistake. Yeah. Absolutely. And, it, you know, it's, it's one of those things where, um, you know, for me, it's, it's important to have an, an ethical kill and persistence hunting. I mean, I always try to make it the the quickest, most, most ethical kill possible. Um, and the, the, the difference is, is that you're right there. You know, you're, you're right in, in the face of that animal with whatever's happening. You're just, you're right there. So you can, you can make an animal have a really quick death, but you know, if, if you shoot an animal with um, a gun or a bow, normally you're, you know, you wait and that animal goes and, and has its own moment. And the difference is when you're, um, you know, when you're persistent hunting, you're, you're literally on top of this animal and it can be pretty intense to say the least. You know, I, I feel like you almost tune out to the point you're, you're so in the zone that, I mean, I've, I've been there and all of a sudden I have this realization that I'm like, sitting on top of a goat and you're just like, what's going on right now? You know, it's, it's really interesting. I think how we, we have that primitive side of our minds that still exists, even though, you know, I grew up in, in suburbia, like I didn't grow up in some, you know, living some feral life, but we still have that in us and it's still like, you can still tap into that. And right. um, I think it's really interesting. Very much so. Uh, Dusty, you want to go on a, a deer hunting trip here with Laura and find out what her most memorable hunt was? Absolutely. I'd love to. Where, where, where are we going here? Where are we, where are we headed? All right. So um, I'm taking you guys up to northern New Hampshire to a town of Groton, right by New Sound Lake. Really beautiful area. Thick woods. Really thick woods. And so um, I'm out hunting with my 44 rifle. It really goes through the brush, brush well. I was a taxidermist in Colorado at the time. So I literally had two days. I flew in for the weekend. That's all I could leave the shop for. And the pressure was on. So I've been um, tracking this buck. Uh, it was before the season ever started. I was still in New Hampshire, and I was just obsessed with this thing. My friend had found one of the antlers the year before, really unique antlers with these big scoops that were in the brow tines, and I was just obsessed with them. So 
I'm tracking this guy and I know, you know, where he was before, before the season, but it's, you know, it's in the middle of the rut now. So things have changed and um, I'm kind of trying to get in the groove of things and I'm trying not to feel the pressure, but I'm also feeling the pressure because, you know, it's, it's two days. I have two days of hunting season. So, you know, I'm out there and I'm, I spend just from before dawn till after, you know, even after shooting light wasn't there, I just, I wanted to, I wanted to be out there to see if I could, I could figure out where he was at. You know, I'm, I'm tracking him and um, I'm on, I'm on his tracks for a while and I, I see his tracks go through these, these two trees and the two trees are like really far apart and he actually had to walk around them because his spread was so big and I'm freaking out and um, first day goes by and I don't see him but I track him all day and I'm thinking I have a really good idea about where he's at because I know the land really well and I'm thinking I know the exact place that he's laying down and I, I spend, you know, I, I actually bring a sleeping bag out. <laughs> I bury myself in this cliff and, you know, I'm, I'm waiting on this ledge and I wait there all night and I get up in the morning and I just want to have the least disturbance in this area of woods. And I get up and I'm moving where I think he is. And the entire morning, I just like, I can't for the life of me find a fresh track. And I'm feeling really down and I'm really upset and you know the day is going on and I just got in that mental state where I'm like this isn't gonna happen I was kind of you know almost frantic about it I was like no I can't you know it, it was meant to be I was supposed to shoot this buck and it's not happening and I was actually walking underneath this ledge and it was in an area he was he was hanging out in this really ledgy area and the sun was the sun was going down and it, it wasn't past legal shooting light yet but I'd given up and so I had the rifle slung across my back and I'm walking along and there was like the littlest bit of fresh powder and I was just, just super bummed. So I'm walking along this ledge and all of a sudden like the tiniest little rock falls down this ledge and my lands right at my feet. And I look up and this buck literally jumps through the sky, like over me. I made jokes later that it was like a Pegasus, you know, it was just like soaring through the air brilliantly. And I swear to God, my, my jaw was on the ground and I didn't even touch the rifle. I like watched him fly over me and I couldn't believe, you know, he landed on this, like, he was like a goat. He landed on the ledge below me and he, you know, he took off and it was, I didn't, I didn't get him. I didn't kill him. I didn't shoot a deer that whole season. I ended up tagging a roadkill deer on my drive home and I got my meat. It was, it was one of those things where I knew where he was and I knew that I knew where he was, but I couldn't. I couldn't make the connection, you know, but then to have that affirmation and having him jump over me like that, I mean, it's the, probably the closest I've been to a deer's feet. (laughs) And, um, yeah, that's, that's probably my most memorable hunting moment was just being like, all right, that's cool. Like I, I felt vindicated and, you know, I think I also had a moment of dealing with my ego and being like, it sucks to be the, you know, the badass taxidermist butcher and to go a deer season and not kill a deer. Like, you feel like a failure and dealing with that part of my ego, but knowing that, that I was right there, you know, and knowing that I did know where he was and knowing that I was in the right vicinity, even when I started to doubt myself. So yeah, I'll never forget that buck. Well, that's intense. That's intense. I can't, I can't, I don't know anybody that's ever said that they had a deer like jump over the top of them as going from ledge to ledge. <laughs> That's incredible. It was amazing. Uh, I'm telling you, these New Hampshire deer, they're rugged. I'm telling you, the New Hampshire guys are rugged, too. You ought to see these goats I hunt with out there. My gosh. (laughs) (laughs) It's amazing. But I can see how that happens. You hunt in some of those ledgy areas, and that's where they kind of hide out. And and if you just happen to get into their zone or their their little bedding area like that, where it's very rocky, I could totally see that happening. Wow. And I feel like he probably, I don't know if it was like he smelled me, but didn't see where I was because, mm-hmm. you know, it was really like normal year think he's going to like slink uphill. He's going to like not be jumping over me as his best option for escaping from the situation. Right. I don't know if the sound was blocked because of the way the ledge was and he just smelled something and took off or, you know, what, um, what made him do that but um it was i can i can i wish i could share the image in my mind with you guys because it was really cool right i mean I'm, they mess up too you know and they they get confused absolutely get, i've seen them you can tell they're smelling something but they can't tell what direction it's coming from maybe there's a swirling wind or something like that i've had deer come mm-hmm. up on me like that and then i can tell they're alerted like they know i'm there but they don't know exactly where then all of a sudden they come right at me and that that's like right the same kind of thing yeah yeah Oh, yeah, cool. <laughs> just, just talking that you had a memorable moose hunt. Can we go there real quick? 
I, I, so I only had one moose hunt. Um, I went with my friend up in Maine. I have never, I've, so I've been out in moosey areas during the rut. You know, I've been treed by moose out in the Tetons before. I've, I've had close calls where I see how crazy they were, but going out and, and hunting moose in Maine and being out there when, you know, they're, it's again, Maine, obviously really, really amazing clear cuts that you can hunt. But once you get into the thick areas, I mean, these clear cuts, some of them are really overgrown and you can't see a moose until you're almost on top of it. And they can't see you and they're so blinded by their hormones that, you know, they hear something walking loudly through the woods and they're going to come right at it. And so, I mean, I think that was the most intense part about it was going out there and just, you know, having to be loud in the woods with something completely new to me, like going through and pretending you're a moose and like sloshing through these swamps and like raking stuff across trees so that they think you're a moose. Like it was completely against any instinct I ever had of hunting. And so that alone was, was one of the most enjoyable things when I felt like a kid stomping around in puddles. And then, you know, the amount of moose that you had come on, like we, me and the, um, my friend Duke, who I was hunting with, we, we turned up, I think three moose in the first day, just because, you know, it was, they were they were everywhere and coming from a place like New Hampshire where the moose population is doing so poorly uh it was really it was really good to see how how good they were doing up in northern Maine I don't know if that's still the case we were going through this really sick remote area and moose like walked right up on a moose didn't have the option of turning him down because it was that moment where you knew that if you didn't take action he was going to come you know right at you and I was hunting with a, a gun I had a seven mag so it was it was over quick but carrying the moose out was you know like I love hunting because it's it's not just that moment there's so many other parts of it and I really wanted the the hide I wanted to have the whole hide we were just doing a, a European mount in the skull so I wanted the entire hide to it for a bedspread so I'm packing this hide out and the hide weighs about as much as I do and I'm really unsteady going through these swamps and I have this you know pack on my back and of course I sound even more moose like but now I'm covered in moose and you know hearing these moose coming at me through the trees and not knowing if I should dump and try to get up a tree, but I don't think I can get the pack off quick enough. And I mean, that's probably scarier than any grizzly encounter I've, I've had just trying to get that moose out of there. You know, it's, I, I really want to go on another moose hunt that for me, like going uh, bow hunting for a moose would be probably one of my ultimate hunts. Very cool. Oh, yeah. Very, very cool. I think the uh, I think the moose population in New Hampshire might have taken a turn for the better this year. And really, that's awesome. Yeah, the reason I say that is that we had a really really dry year uh, in New Hampshire. So it's basically knocked down the ticks, and the tick the winter tick was what was killing off all mm-hmm. the moose for the most part. So I think yeah. What we're going to see is a, a drastic reduction in tick population, which should help awesome. future generations of moose. I don't think we're out of the water yet, but I think it should help them re- regenerate a little bit. Yeah, I'm not going to lie. Like, I am, you know, the, the biggest hunter advocate out there, but I was a little bummed out that New Hampshire kept the moose hunt when the numbers were down. I mean, I know it's a big revenue maker and that's important, but um, I mean, when I used to go out years ago, I, you know, I couldn't go out in my backyard without seeing three or four moose. And I found, I mean, I've really only seen dead moose the last three years and I find them every single spring. And I mean, this one calf I found, I was walking up to it and I thought I could have, you bet a million dollars in the fact that it had a radio collar on, but it was just, you know, all the ticks just all around his neck. And it was just so sick. It was disgusting and horrible. And, um, I'm so glad they're coming back because that was really depressing. Yeah, I think this not only because of the fact that I love hunting for moose antlers. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, that is a cool, cool aspect. I think. I mean, and, and I, I, this is just my pure observation. There's, we, we won't know until the spring, but just here, knowing how dry it was, and knowing my my actual experience walking through the woods in the fall, where I usually find areas that I, were in, over the last ten years. It seemed like I would get ticks, especially in the last few years. They would, I could walk through an area in the fall and still have ticks on me. I didn't have that happen mm-hmm. this year. And I think it was b- awesome. because of the drought. So that's an indicator to me that if I'm not getting covered in ticks, neither are they. From what I saw this fall where I was deer hunting, I saw a lot of moose. And it seemed like they looked healthier than I've seen them over the last five years. Just, just a mm-hmm. pure observation. So hopefully, statistically, that carries forward too but that was my uh just pure speculative observation being out in the woods this year fingers crossed 
I yes. mean, it, it was bad there for a minute. So any any improvement would be awesome. All right, Laura, I've got 10 rapid fire questions for you. Number one, what's your number one hunting tip of all time? Learn to think like the animal. I like that a lot. That's a very good one. All right, we have these things that it drives us crazy if we leave at home or in the truck or at camp and we're out in the woods and we're hunting. What's that one thing for you that you kind of don't feel quite as as comfortable in the woods without? I mean, I guess a knife, but I think that's the brilliance of being survivalist is I feel comfortable with nothing. Oh, that's awesome. I really like that answer. Very cool. <laughs> All right, you, you seem to be pretty easygoing and mild-mannered, but what's your biggest pet peeve in life? Oh, people with lots of excuses. People who have an excuse for the reason that they aren't happy or they don't do something they've always wanted to do. So there's always a way around it. Gotcha. Very cool. All right. And you said you're 30, what was it 31? Is that what you said? Mm-hmm. You're 31 today. What would you tell the 15-year-old Laura Zira, knowing what you know today about life? You don't have to listen to what anyone says you should do because whatever you want to do, you really can do it. Gotcha. Very cool. All right. You're somewhere in the world at a hunting convention, and a stranger walks up to you and and strikes a conversation. They ask you what you do for a living. What do you tell them? (laughs) I never really know how to answer that question, and I usually (laughs) awkward say that, awkwardly say I'm a survivalist, and then they don't really know how to respond to that. (laughs) Right. Then they're like, okay. (laughs) Then what? Okay. Aren't we all surviving? (laughs) (laughs) That's pretty funny. All right. What did you have for breakfast this morning? I had uh, eggs with spinach. Nice. No roadkill? No roadkill. Gotcha. Super boring today. <laughs> it's kind of boring. <laughs> right, you, get your, you get your own billboard on the side of Route 93 in New Hampshire. It's a blank canvas. What would you put on that billboard? Oh, God. Um, I don't know. Maybe my phone number and people telling me to call me when they find a dead moose so that I can have a freezer full of moose meat. <laughs> That's awesome. Call me if you find a dead moose. <laughs> It's actually a really good idea. I think it I, is. You know, yeah, it'd be right there. You know, right. they could see it right there. It'd be fresh in their mind. Yeah, you hit a deer, call me. You hit a moose, call me. Yeah. If I say the word successful to you, who's the first person that pops into your head and why? Ooh, wow. That's a really good question. Right. I, I don't know if I can answer that. Okay. You really caught me off guard with that one. I also don't know who my hero would be. I don't know who. I think that's like so in the mind of the beholder that like only you know if you're successful. So I feel like that's really hard. What's a typical day in your life look like? It's always different. I have to have some kind of adventure, whether it be because, you know, I'm on the 25th day of a survival expedition or, you know, even if I'm doing computer work, I always try to get out at least once a day and and do something that um, is out of the norm. Um, but yeah, there's no normal, um, get up at different times every day, go to bed at different times every day. I'm usually in a different location. Most days, I'm probably the hardest person that you're going to ask that question to. Okay. And how about a deer hunting day? What's a typical deer hunting day look like for you? I really got into sleeping outside in the forest. So I usually wake up in a pile of leaves somewhere (laughs) and then take off. I'm into sitting like during the like when it's first legal shooting light and into probably you know the the 8 30 region or so i'll sit and then um if i haven't seen anything then i'll I'll start moving and then i'm i'm sitting for the last little bit of the day too okay all right that's fantastic all right those are the 10 questions did extremely well thank you for doing that so Laura, thank you yeah what can we expect out of you in the the near future here is there more survivalist television to come um and what other projects do you have going on Yeah, I'll keep you posted. There's uh, several projects I have in the works, so um, I have to be top secret about those for now, but definitely keep an eye out. And until then, I'm I'm working on writing my first book, and I have a survival consulting business as well where I give people advice. I do location scouting for TV shows and kind of kind of work to uh, to teach people from wherever I'm at. I like running workshops as well. If I know that I'm going to be in a certain location ahead of time, um, I try to set something up. But yeah, it's been been virtual more often than not these days. Gotcha. All right. So, and just so we know, anybody that's listening to the show, you know, we have this incredible blanket of social media out there. Where are all the places Mm -hmm. out there on the interwebs that we can find you? Yeah. So you can find me on Twitter and Instagram. And my handle is just at Laura Zara. So it's easy to use my name. On Facebook, I'm one of two Laura Zara's in the world. So I'm pretty easy to find on there as well. 
that's that's the three main things I do: Facebook, okay. Twitter, and Instagram. And then uh, my website is just laurazera.com. Gotcha, uh, Laura. Thanks for taking time out of your day to join us. Yeah, thank you guys so much for having me. I have to say, this is probably one of the most fun interviews we've ever done. She's hardcore, man, and she's just a free, fun, life-loving spirit, and I don't know how you, how you can't like that. Yeah, for sure. It's, uh, it's amazing, the, the knowledge that she has about survival and the, you know, the places she's been, and it's super interesting. I just love her story, and it was just uh, had a great time. I'm so glad we met her out in Vegas. Oh, Dusty, do we have a Chubby Times Tip of the Week this week? Yeah, Jam, we'll get into a little bit about apparel. You know, sometimes... Uh... The Chubby Tines Tip of the Week is sponsored by Morse's Sporting Goods. Firearms, use firearms, bows, use bows. Located at 85 Kentucky Falls Road in Hillsborough, New Hampshire. Give Jim a call at 603-464-3444, morse'sportinggoods.com. Your dollars go further in New Hampshire. There's no sales tax. Morse's Sporting Goods. I, I'm, I'm kind of... Not cheap on apparel, but I like to find a bargain. And, man, right now is the time to get out to your local outdoor sporting goods store and find your apparel for the 2017 season. A lot of uh, winter hunting clothes are on clearance right now, and it's uh, time to utilize the, the sales and, and replenish your your uh, wish list as far as uh, your hunting attire. Very cool, man. Uh, in the meantime, Dusty, when we're not hanging out here on the mic in the studios, where can we find you? First and foremost, shoot me an email, dusty at bigbuckregistry.com. I'll get back to you on there. You can also look me up on Facebook at Chubby Tines Outdoors or Instagram or Twitter at Chasing Antler. Jay, where can the people reach out to you when you're not on the mic? Best place is jay at bigbuckregistry.com. That's my email. Always tune in to the Big Buck Registry Deer Hunting Podcast on iTunes, and you can get there by going to Big bigbuckregistry.com forward slash iTunes. Very simple. We're on all social media platforms. Uh, we're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. It's bigbuckregistry.com forward slash Facebook, bigbuckregistry.com forward slash Twitter, and bigbuckregistry.com forward slash Instagram. We're on YouTube where you can not only listen to all the shows, but we've got some or a lot of our other videos being posted there. We actually did the pre-podcast show with Laura. It's is all active over there now, so if you want to go back and listen to what we did on Thursday Night Live, it's all right there at your fingertips. Oh, and finally, if you'd like to become a patron of this show, please reach out to us by going to bigbuckregistry.com forward slash pledge, and all of the instructions will be right there for you to peruse through and decide how you'd like to support the show. We could definitely use the help. I'm Jay Scott. And I'm Dusty Phillips. And this is the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. We'll see you next week. Can't wait. Can't wait.